So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Initiative for Agency and Development Public Talk Series. I am Tawhidur Rahman. I am a professor in Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Department of Economics. And also I am the founding director of IFAP. For external participants who are for the first time joining us for talk today, IFAD is a, an experimentation initiative at University of Arizona. We are a group of interdisciplinary research scholars and development practic practitioners who work on the issues of agency and development uh, and, and in a partnership with international institutions and collaborators around the world. Today, now let me welcome our speaker today, Dr. Nora Lastig. Dr. Lustig is Samuel Z. Stone Professor of Latin American Economics and Director of Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University. She is also non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, Center for Global Development and Inter-American Dialogue. She is the founding member and President Emeritus of Latin American and Caribbean Economic Association. More importantly, many of you my students particularly in the audience know that Dr. Lustig also served on one of the most important commission on poverty, Atkinson Commission on Poverty, it, which was a high level group on measuring economic progress and social progress. And she was also the 20, G20 eminent persons global group on global financial governance. She is now president elect of Society for the Study of Income Inequality economic inequality. She received her doctorate from, in economics from University of California and Berkeley. More importantly, this, this is why I'm really excited that Dr. Lustig is able to join us. Uh, she is arguably the most important researcher and voice on the issues of inequality in Latin America. More personally, whatever I know about particularly issues of poverty and inequality in Latin America. It is largely from her path-breaking work. And so it is personally, it is a great satisfaction that Dr. Lustig can join us today. So now I will welcome her to give, she's going to talk about persistence of inequality in Latin America. And I bet given her past talk, it will be really insightful. For, for logistics, if you have any questions, please, keep it for the end and raise your hand using the Zoom features and we will have a, so Dr. Lusting will talk for about 40 to 50 minutes, depending on how long she wants to go. And then we will have approximately 30 minutes for the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Uh, welcome Dr. Lustig. And now the stage is yours. Well, thank you. Let me, am I, yeah, I am not unmuted. I just wanna double check. So thank you very much actually for your very kind invitation and for your extremely kind introduction. It is a pleasure to join you in your uh, initiative for agency and development at the University of Arizona and uh, to be able to share, um, by, you know, sort of many years of different types of research that we've been doing on both the evolution and determinants of inequality in, in Latin America. Um, so I am going to be presenting a PowerPoint because there's many things that it's better if I show you what's happening with graphs at the same time that I am speaking since uh, it helps understand better some of the messages that I will plan to share today uh, during this uh, conversation that I'm gonna have with your group. Let me now try to share then the PowerPoint. I know it works because we tried it earlier but I will activate it. And can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So um, I, even though, you know, some of the work has already been presented, I keep uh, sort of changing the name uh, of my, my presentation because as you will see, uh, Latin America went through a period of declining inequality in the particularly at the beginning of this century, the first 10 years. 
And then sort of that process uh, came to a halt, not in all countries, in some countries inequality to continue to decline, but in others, it actually either petered out or it started to reverse itself. But then, you know, we had the COVID-19 pandemic and I'm going to end my talk by discussing what the implications of the pandemic might be for the future of inequality in the region based on some of the research that we've been doing primarily through education. So my talk will have these uh, three parts. Uh, start with the evolution, the determinants, and then the third one will be on this uh, COVID-19. And for one and two, I'm relying on, a, it's actually a chapter that was published in Spanish, but then uh, I got it translated into English, so it would be uh, accessible in English as well. And it's part of our working paper series in the, in the CEQ Institute. And you can access it by just going visit our website and. Uh, and then um, actually I should probably put it on the chat. I'm gonna put the link on the chat in a bit so everybody can have access to the website. All right, so what about evolution? Alan, and I'm going to focus uh, primarily 90s, 2000s and since. Uh, data for previous decades, even though it exists, is very scant. There's very few countries for which you can do a long-term analysis of inequality. And if we have issues of comparability with surveys in the more recent period, when once you start going 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, and beyond, it becomes uh, really a tour de force. And you have to make many assumptions in order to get series that are consistent. But I thought you know, it's very interesting to share what happened, particularly during the period of declining inequality, because that, um, brings to the fore the fact that it is something that can happen in countries as well. It's not always inequality that doesn't go away or inequality that rises. We've also had experiences of declining inequality uh, and that is important to understand why it happened and maybe there are some even some policy lessons that can be shared to have it reproduce in Latin America and elsewhere. So, what um, in sort of very broad terms, in the 1990s, inequality tended to rise in most of the region. Then between 2000, early 2000s and the 2013 approximately, which is the end of the commodity boom uh, period in Latin America, South America particularly benefited from it quite a bit. Inequality declined and it declined in every country. That's you know very amazing, a very amazing phenomenon which we hadn't seen <clears throat> except for the period of uh, the 1930s and 40s and uh, 50s in the uh, advanced countries. You also experience a decline in inequality, and uh, the work that has been done by Piketty and others attributes that primarily to the impact of what happened with the Great Depression and the war, which destroyed capital and therefore incomes at the top uh, fell. So it's unusual to have this systematic decline in inequality and that's why it is an exciting period to study. Since 2013, the picture that emerged and I'm talking now up to the pandemic was checkered. And in a lot of countries, inequality did not continue to decline and some started to increase and in some it continued to decline. Uh, and the pandemic is uh, introduced, increases in inequality depending on the extent of safety nets that were introduced in the short term, but I'm going to focus more on what the impact is going to be for the longer term, primarily based on what the pandemic did to, to education. All right, so this is a, a graph that shows by country what happened between the so early 90s and early 2000s, and uh, the diagonal in the graph sort of shows if everybody was on the diagonal it would have mean no change in the Gini coefficient between the two periods. I presume that people are familiar with the Gini coefficient, but just as a reminder, it's a standard measure of inequality that lies between zero and one. The closer to one, the more unequal, the closer to zero, the less unequal. 
but uh, here what I'm showing is, so, you know, Latin America has pretty high inequality in some countries. In Brazil in the early 90s had genies of 0.9. And the lowest inequalities were found in Uruguay, Venezuela, Costa Rica, and Argentina. Anything that lies above the diagonal means that there was an increase in inequality during this period. Anything that's below a decline in inequality. And most of the countries are above the diagonal. So this is a period of increasing inequality. What happened during this period is uh, there was quite a bit of uh, market uh, liberalization policies. And uh, some of them, uh, and um, some of them, jointly with what had happened with the sort of slower than before expansion of education in the 80s as a result of the big debt crisis of the 80s led to an increase in the skill premium that is the wage gap between educated higher education people and lower education people widened and that was one of the main factors that drove the increase in inequality in the 90s. Then we come to the period of uh, the early 2000s, the first decade of the country and lo and behold, everybody lies below the diagonal. So that's quite an amazing result. Every single country experienced that. Even countries that are highly unequal like uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, they did experience a decline. Uh, since then, <laughs> this uh, auspicious period did not persist. And what we've seen is that uh, between 2013 and 2017, which is the most recent data before the pandemic, uh, there was almost no change. Some countries experienced still a little bit of a decline in inequality, and some countries began to show a reversal. In fact, Brazil is one of the countries in which we saw a reversal, which has exacerbated with even more recent data. Um, so all in all, when you look at the entire period, it is in the 30 years, practically every country also experienced a decline in inequality except for Costa Rica if you took, take the entire 1990s period uh, uh, to the year around just before the pandemic. Uh, if you're a genie skeptic, or if you like to see other uh, indicators, we also show here the income share ratios of the richest com uh, compared to the lowest decile, and uh, also between 92 and 2017 circa. And the story is the same. So it doesn't depend on the inequality indicator. And we did lots of robustness checks. For example, right now, most of the databases have converged, but for a while, the UN ECLAC, the Economic Commission, tended to have slightly different numbers for a number of reasons than the World Bank sites. But no matter what database you use, the uh, result was observed that inequality declined. So at this point, we say, okay, then uh, we have an interesting period. Let's try to hone in on what happened during this period. And I wanna show you also what uh, it, the story of Latin America looks in comparison with other parts of the world. As you can see, now, I mean, this is the only region in which you find this striking decline. There was a little bit of decline in Asia, some in Europe, uh, Middle East has very little data, so this I would take with a, with a grain of salt, but this is, you know, remarkable, right? So what are the determinants of this period of declining inequality? And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, by the way, you know, this was a project that we started um, with my co-author, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, who I know has been in your, in your program before. And when we started, uh, was back in the 2000s, 2007, I think. Our main question was, so why is that inequality doesn't fall in Latin America? And once we started looking at the data, data we said, oh, but it's been falling. I mean, and nobody had realized. We were among the first that actually realized that this was happening. And uh, we published a book that came out at Brookings uh, in 2010. 
And what was interesting is a pervasiveness because uh, inequality had declined in both countries that were growing fast, like Chile and Peru, but also low growth country like Mexico. Mexico hasn't been growing. Uh, for, for those who follow Mexico or Latin America, you may be aware that Mexico's growth rate has been quite uh, disappointing for the last 30 years, around 2% per year. It also happened in countries that were governed by the left and countries that were gov uh, governed by countries, by governments that were not um, in the left or center, center right. So it was not something that was driven by the ideology of the governments in power. Importantly, it was experienced by commodity exporters, but also by commodity importers, which uh, a lot of people were saying, oh yeah, I mean, in retrospect, when they look at this period, they say it's a commodity boom. It gave you more uh, fiscal space and more growth with higher employment in areas that probably were using intensive, um, more intensively uh, or low skilled labor like construction and other services that are intensive in low skilled labor. But also countries that are commodity importers like El Salvador and the rest of Central America. And Mexico, which is not, even though it exports oil on balance, it's not a net commodity exporter, experienced a decline. In, interestingly, in some countries, it was very important what happened to the minimum wage, but inequality fell, both in countries in which minimum wages went up and countries with stagnant minimum wages like Mexico. So our task was in a way to say, well, what's a common thread in such a diverse group of countries. And we think we found two main factors that happened during this period. Uh, and like I said, these can be interesting if you have policy lessons to sort of see how you can have a significant because five Gini points is a lot for an average for, for a region of a decline. I mean, uh, as, as you know, people joke and say that watching the Gini change is as interesting as watching the grass grow. So when you have five Gini points coming down, that's very, very exciting. So what was the common thread in this period? And uh, we actually think there are two main factors that were pretty common throughout the region. One had to do with educational expansion, the upgrading of education in the labor force. And the second one had to do with introduction of um, targeted cash transfers. There is uh, this work that has been done decomposing the changes of inequality and trying to attribute to different components of income, which were the driving forces and it confirms what we um, found in our study. This is another work that uh, is, was done uh, by people at the World Bank that looked at all the, uh, all the countries. This is the average. And what it shows is that 60%, 62% of the decline in overall inequality comes from a decline in earnings inequality. That's the light blue area, this one. Around 17% came from transfers. That's primarily remittances. Sorry, uh, this is uh, public transfers. Another comes from 15% comes from other income, which here it includes private transfers. And here is where remittances would appear, which have exercised an equalizing force in the countries that have large influx of uh, remittances. And then pensions and capital incomes here also play an equalizing role, but much more minor. So we think that we need to find out primarily what happened here, why is the earnings inequality fell, and also why is it that now uh, public government transfers became an in, in cash transfers became an important factor explaining inequality. So we started, uh, I always describe it as peeling the onion. You first, it's sort of where you look at proximate causes, that's, you know, it's not an exercise of identifying causality, it's a proximate cause, it's a change, the decline in earnings inequality that is about 
almost two thirds of the factor that explains in an accounting framework the decline in overall inequality, income inequality. And uh, so what is it that lies behind it? What uh, we ended up finding is that uh, it's driven primarily by the reduction in the wage premium for uh, people with higher levels of education. So then, okay, you find this. And so what drove the decline in the wage premium? That's the next uh, layer of the onion. So what we did is we started investigating what had happened with the composition of the labor force by um, type of education. And we found that because of the expansion of education in the 1990s, the relative supply of workers with education above secondary, secondary or above rather, became relatively more abundant. Sorry, you were showing something? Became relatively more abundant and that this made uh, just everything else equal. When one factor becomes more abundant, its relative return declined. So that's that's the story in a nutshell. And uh, so it's an education story because we think that uh, thanks to, I mean, there was a big push after the 1980s crisis in which many countries, even though education continued to improve in average years of schooling, the rate at which it improved it was lower than in previous decades, and it was associated with the debt crisis, then there was a push to re-expand access to education and more and more people were able to complete high school and beyond. Um, and here, you know, you can see here, I have a graph with the relative returns from everybody, like, you know, everybody from returns to primary, primary, secondary, and tertiary education relative to no education or incomplete primary, all of those tended to fall in every country. And that is what drove the uh, reduction in earnings inequality. The other part of the story are transfers and transfers here. It's interesting because the 1990s were characterized by the introduction of the large scale cash transfers, the first one was in Mexico through Progresa and started as a pilot in 94, then in 97 became full-fledged, then Bolsa Familia in Brazil, and then it's sort of practically every country has some form of targeted cash transfers that uh, increase the income per capita of households, in the case of Mexico and Brazil between 10 and 20%, in other countries it's less, but this was, uh, a very important change in the technology of social policy that uh, had never been implemented in Latin America before. And it reached in both, in the, many of the cases, the poorest of the poor because it reached people in rural areas, even living in um, places that were uh, far away and remote. So those two uh, phenomena that are linked to policy are behind the uh, important decline in inequality during the 2000s. Now, there were reinforcing factors, and we've just finished a paper that looks at to what extent policies that were implemented by regime. I mean, at some point in Latin America in the 2000s, uh, 11 of the 17 countries were governed by a left or left-leaning type of executive. Uh, and uh, they implemented policies that were different, particularly, uh, I'm gonna mention in a moment, uh, some that had to do uh, with uh, the minimum wage, for example. But here you can see that just descriptively that countries governed by, by the left, which is the orange, uh, experience a sharper decline in inequality than the non-left, which is the gray. And uh, this could be just spurious, but we did an econometric analysis and we do find that it is significant to have a significant statistically, I mean, to have a leftist government in place to have a more pronounced decline in inequality, not necessarily sustainable, by the way, 
but during the period, it was more contemporaneously, it was more pronounced. And one of the things that uh, we found is that uh, the minimum wages were increased by more in really real terms by lefty governments than that by the non-left. That's the red line versus the blue line, the gray average here. Uh, the other two factors were that governments uh, that were um, ideologically on the left, they implemented uh, also more um, generous non-contributory pension programs for uh, the elderly. And also they expanded the uh, tax base redistribution. You can see that the ratio of taxes to GDP were increased by more. This probably was in by the structural trends in the composition of the labor force or the transfers that were implemented by the government. By the way, the targeted cash transfers were implemented equally by leftist and non-leftist regimes. You don't see a difference. This was a sort of non-political uh, identity uh, attached to, to uh, the conditional cash transfers. With the end of the super cycle of commodities in a bunch of countries, you see inequality no longer falling. The super cycle ended around 2012. And uh, in some countries, you've seen a reduction in the decline, like Chile, Peru, and Uruguay. Uh, in some, it didn't continue to decline, like Argentina. And you've seen a reversal, like in Brazil and Paraguay. But there were also other countries, which to me are, I have to say, a mystery. I don't know much about them. But countries like El Salvador and Honduras continue to experience a decline. And you know, sort of like there is a disconnect there because El Salvador is known as a pretty violent, uh, in terms of uh, polarized country. So it's interesting that you know, the, the, if you look at the data, the Gini coefficient in the last 10, 15 years fell by 10 points, which is huge. So some interesting uh, potential research to understand how you can have these two things happening at the same time is warranted. Nevertheless, uh, by the way, we're starting now a project trying to understand what has been behind this, whether it's a reversal of what we found in the past, like is it that no longer the skill premium has uh, started to increase in the countries? Is it related to the composition of the labor force or the sort of re, uh, retraction of some of the policies that were the reinforcing ones. And we hope to have answers in the next uh, couple of years after we finish the project, which will be a continuation of what we did on the 2000s. I wanna say something about the limitation of the data that uh, to give pause to everybody, this data all is also service-based. And as we know, the household surveys do not capture well what happens at the top. Uh, there's now an increasing industry of uh, producing corrected data, and particularly led by Whit World in the Paris School of Economics, Piketty's team, and Facundo Alvaredo and his colleagues have been doing the work for Latin America. Um, several of the PhD students from the Paris School have also been producing a corrected data for many of the countries in, in Latin America. And the story changes when you take into account the correction at the top. However, it's still true that earnings inequality declined. So that what I said earlier subsists, survives. And it's also true that cash transfers helped reduce inequality because uh, they were targeted to the poor. But let me just show you what happens when you have corrected data. This is for Brazil, and this is the income held by the top 10%. The orange is the household survey-based data, and so it shows a decline. But when you correct with tax records, then that's a green. 
no longer a decline. And when, I mean, they also do corrections using national accounts. So the levels become higher, a larger concentration at the top and the decline is no longer present. So probably if you have capital incomes well captured, the story of declining inequality gets tempered. And it's more story of declining earnings inequality, okay? Uh, same thing for Chile. This is survey based. This is corrected with the tax returns. And same thing for Uruguay. This is survey based and this is corrected for tax returns. And here is the top 1%, not the top 10%. So this is something to bear in mind. But like I said, the story of what happened to the labor market is still very interesting and valid. All right, so let me finish by telling you a little bit, well, so what about the future? I mean, so you had decline in equality in some countries, there was a reversal, but remember that I show you this graph that for the entire period, it still was a story of declining uh, inequality, for sure earnings inequality and inequality associated to transfers. Uh, so that, uh, what about the future? Okay, so COVID hits, and I, like I said, I'm not going to work to discuss what's the short-term impact. In some countries, inequality went up. In Brazil, it came down because they spent an enormous amount of safety nets in 2020, which is surprising. So poverty was lower than in 2019 for a period of time, unsustainably so. But the more interesting thing is what may happen as a result of the impact on education. Uh, and uh, Latin America experienced a very severe shock with uh, the pandemic. Health-wise, economic-wise, and education-wise. At some point in 2020, about 90%, 97%, almost entire region of children were not in regular classrooms. And school closures affect the poor children disproportionately because they have a much harder time trying to replace it with uh, homeschooling or other forms that are not the classroom. And so we think that uh, because of what's happened, we likely end up with uh, lower achievements for these uh, groups and many may not continue uh, at all which will result in lower intergenerational mobility in the future, future higher inequality opportunity. Like, and also depending on the scale of this phenomenon, it can be also a reversal of uh, earnings in inequality going back up as a result of the changes in the composition of human capital. Because remember the story was that inequality declined because people with higher levels of education became relatively more abundant. But if the poor hit disproportionately by the pandemic, that can lead to a reversal. So what did, I mean, we did a counterfactual exercise. By the way, I think I cited the, the wrong one here in the PowerPoint. It's a pub, it was published in the Journal of Economic Inequality in 2021, a paper by Knight Herfer, me and Mariano Tomasi, and uh, you can download it from there with the methodology is quite complex, but essentially it's a counterfactual for uh, using data that has information on the education of the child and the, edu and the education of the parent. We uh, sort of shock people who were in the, if you want, labor force should they be unborn in on the closest cohort to the cohort that is now in school and try to sort of predict what would have happened if they were shocked with the pandemic uh, and in comparison to what happened uh, actually. So this was a story in, of uh, you know, a likelihood to complete secondary education, a Latin American average, children of low educated parents, which means less than high school, and children of highly educated parents, high school or beyond. And the tendency was for the two to sort of get closer. Uh, so what happened, what might happen as a result of the pandemic because of um, to the cohort that was born that's now in school? This is what we try to answer. 
And here, I mean, one of the things that drives the inequality in replacing the classroom is access to internet. Here we have the inequality in access to internet in most countries is pretty sharp, except for um, Argentina, which has similar levels of access for different groups, socioeconomic groups, but in most countries it is quite unequal. And also as uh, the other factors in particular, the ability of parents to help children do homeschooling depends a lot on the parents' education and children of uneducated parents, therefore gonna have a much more disadvantageous situation even if they have access to internet. So here we show what the actual loss as a proportion of the school year for children, for disadvantaged children, low education parents versus advantaged children, the parents with high school or beyond. And you can see that the differences can be quite striking. Uh, you see that Nicaragua is one that it, it's not very striking. It's because Nicaragua almost didn't close the schools. So it, it is the result of not implementing school closures. But all the countries that implement the school closures experience uh, these uh, differential losses. So speaking of the question mark, what we found is that, okay, everybody will suffer, but uh, the extent to which children from lower educational background lower socioeconomic background will suffer is much more. And uh, interestingly, the prediction is that uh, children that were born in this cohort could reach high school completion rates that were similar to children that were born in the 1960s. So it is a pretty severe shock. And here we have it by country. You can see the change from the light green to the dark green is the impact of COVID for children in households with high socioeconomic background and the pink and the red is for children, low socioeconomic background. And you can see how different it is. I mean, these are able to replace versus these which are not. So the bottom line is that uh, this can actually become the seed of future inequality, future rising inequality in the region, again, as a result of a story that is linked to education, because instead of bringing an access to education more, um, more vividly to, to families, to, to poor children, it's actually going to uh, affect them negatively. And therefore, it would be kind of like a reversal a reverse story from what we saw in the 2000s. So let me stop here and thank you very much. So th thank you, thank you. This is wonderful. So many, uh, uh, so many new things, and 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 uh, so so now let's open it for question and answer uh, Q and A. And we uh, our first is my colleague Price Fishback. Price, go ahead. Yeah, I, had, I missed this at the beginning. I'm, on the Gini coefficients, were the Gini coefficients before taxes and transfers or after taxes and transfers, the ones you showed at the beginning? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good question because that's what we do at the Institute all the time. So, <laughs> you know, in, in general, uh, what, what people measure is uh, assume to be the disposable income. I say assume because Strictly speaking, you are not entirely sure in some surveys and people are not asked, is this before or after taxes? So uh, the web, the, the, all, the, all the databases that are either in CEPAL, which is the UN Economic Commission or the World Bank's uh, CEDLAC, which is based in Universidad de La Plata and it's a joint effort with the World Bank. What they, they do is they assume that people who are wage earners in the formal sector, report netto taxes. Uh, people that are in the informal sector don't pay direct taxes. And the, then depending on what the survey says it, about transfers, they assume that it is disposable, try to just assume, I mean, the are cases in which they're not gonna be able to deal with it. So I think that, that to answer your question is, it is assumed that it is disposable link. So after. After, okay. Yeah, but after direct taxes and 
right. direct transfers, okay? Right. Not because in, well, in the work that we do, we also bring in the impact of sales taxes, VAT, subsidies to consumption, which leads to another income concept called consumable income, but that's not produced on a large scale, except mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. Charles. Uh, hi, uh, my, I'm, uh, my name is Charles Nusser. I'm uh, a, a professor of economics here at the University of Arizona. And uh, my, my question is about um, cohort effects. So if I understood correctly, a big high investment education in the decade of the 90s then translated to lower, lower inequality from 2002 to 2013. And if that's the case, it should be concentrated among younger workers. So the younger workers who went to school during that time would be the ones who would have the higher wages and the reduction in quality be driven by them. And so the first part of my question is, do you see that in the data that's very different for younger workers than older workers wouldn't have been affected by those educational investments? And the, the second part of the question is, if you know, if if that's if that you know if real if as you say you know the education is the big driver of the inequality reduction, is there any way to have continuing education for older workers to raise their productivity to to improve uh, to improve inequality of uh, you know to kind of get that group to have higher wage income. Have higher wage. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very interesting question. The only country in which we did a deep dive to assess what happened in terms of uh, different age groups is Mexico. And we found what you predict, that uh, younger workers are the ones that, um, that were able to capture the higher wages. And uh, what seems to have happened is that there was also, we call it sort of premature obsolescence. Um, I think that what our explanation that might have happened is that entire tiers of people that were qualified, like you know, accounting, etc., had been replaced by a combination of workers younger that are cheaper and use technology. And uh, so those, uh, those were probably the losers of, of the process. And I am, you know, I'm not an expert on, on training or education, so I don't know what you can do to rescue this group. I think these are uh, disgruntled groups in, in, in many countries, because I think it's a phenomenon that's more common, even in countries in which inequality overall didn't decline. You probably have the same phenomenon as well. Uh, so it's even worse, but uh, I don't know what you really, really could do. But in principle, I think that it's socially it will be important to uh, because then you, you know you cannot you have these three problems happening: workers are getting displaced, life expectancy is increasing, and pension systems are under, under stress. So you can, so you will need to find a way to square the circle. Otherwise, it is an, a sort of a pretty explosive situation, even socially as well, because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be very angry. You know, they're getting a, pensions are getting eroded in, in either because of inflation or because even uh, pension systems are already telling people you're not going to get what you were supposed to, and uh, that's uh, that's I think, but. Like I said, I'm not an expert on what kind of policies you can do for, uh, the, for, for dealing with that, uh, the productivity of people who were prematurely obsolescent, ob declared obsolete. You know. So uh, Dr. Lustig, uh, following up Charles' question, I had, this was, Charles asked the question I was going to ask. So, but I had, uh, this is all aggregate. So you are looking at national level Gini coefficient uh, post uh, before tax, after taxes with transfer. Uh, is there any other dimensions? For example, let's say your two big determinants are education and transfer, public transfer. Has it come at the cost of increasing income inequality in rural and urban areas? Because educational improvement in rural areas uh, if that is the primary driver, do you see that 
while overall income inequality has declined, but rural income, there is a special dimension, particularly rural urban, and any other social group dimension to it, because many Latin American countries, you know, that uh, you know better than anyone else, is that there are different ethnic groups also. And there has been uh, some of it also from your own prior work about polarization. In Latin America, it is not just about income inequality, but there has been concentration of income inequality in certain socio you know, ethnic groups. So do you see that there has been other dimensions that is being hidden by declining income inequality that you are showing? So that is my question one. Second question and is related to your explanation. And this is maybe just I'm curious, is that one take for you is that, that of course it is about, uh, one is that role of education and you know, education premium. And your second explanation is public transfer. And, and why there was a significant public transfer, you th it seems like your argument is, it is mainly because of leftist government. Now, if I am thinking about it, is it about leftist government or is it there is a more positive story that these leftist governments were characterized by more social accountability, more local level governance reform or corruption? So, so what I'm thinking about it is, is it just about new regime came, they were left oriented and they were more activist and they were respond, responding to electoral needs. Or also, in addition to that, there were some, uh, at, at a micro level, governance reform that led to more uh, reallocation of resources to in response to public, particularly in Paraguay. Paraguay was, you know, you look at even World Bank and uh, your co-author, Louis Filippi, and my friend, you know, he talks about a role of governance and particularly in Latin America, he has been focusing and he finds that there is a lot of heterogeneity. You know, this is not just left. So, so th th this was my second question. So if you, yeah. So, okay, uh, two things. In terms of income groups, um, I haven't done a systematic review of this, but uh, we don't find that inequalities. I mean, one of the reasons why inequality fell is the urban rural gap also declined. I mean, the countries that you have this uh, decompositions, uh, the gaps declined and uh, people in rural areas had access to education. I mean, especially there was this push for um, all the younger children to be able to access schools and you had the cash transfer programs that also had conditionality and us parents to send the kids to school. So you had a sort of big push even in rural areas. So rural urban, no, didn't increase. And also the, the racial inequality, ethnic inequality declined you know, for the countries in which they, there is uh, results that look at um, what happened for example, Brazil, Afro descendants, versus uh, the white population inequality declined as well among groups. And importantly in Brazil, what they found, uh, because for that country there was an analysis by, by region is that wages in the hinterland increased by more than the metropolis. So you did have also within regional, between regions, the regions that were more backward or the cities that lived that were in, in, country, in, in areas that were um, more ruralized, even if they were cities, the wages declined versus um, the metropolis. So no, there's no hidden rising inequality here. Uh, and uh, I am kind of wondering, uh, you know, when I asked, for example, in El Salvador, how come you have such a um, violent situation and polarized country with this other story happening simultaneously? Is either the data on inequality all wrong or is there something that is explaining this disconnect or this apparent disconnect? Well, some people say, well, to some extent, the decline in inequality in El Salvador is linked to remittances. Remittances are a significant part of people's incomes, but it means that the country itself cannot provide the option of having a remunerated employment that would be 
in the country. People have to migrate in order to do this. So it may, that may be part of the story. But like I said, this is a very interesting, I mean, people don't tend to study in the smaller countries. And I think there's some interesting stories ongoing that should be picked up. With respect to your second question, actually cash transfers, the CCT, the conditional cash transfers, were not implemented by the left. The, uh, I mean, that's um, probably I didn't make myself clear. It was not a leftist, uh, on the contrary. Our econometric analysis shows that there is no, uh, if you want significance, if you look at uh, the left dummy, which is the dummy variable that we use for identifying regime ideology, there is no significance. It doesn't matter. It was implemented across the board. And it was a response to probably the Latin America was experiencing democratization so, you know, in the 1990s. And it was probably the fact that that was by, by James Robinson, for example, he argues that you had people with a voice through the electoral system that did not have a voice before, and that facilitated the sort of putting in place these programs across the board, not just by, by leftists. What the leftist governments did more is they expanded more generously the non-contributory social pensions and the minimum wage, but not, not cash transfers, uh, not the big program, not the big conditional cash transfers, Progresa and, and Bolsa Familia were implemented by governments that are not considered left. They're considered either center or center right, in fact. No? Okay. I think you're Ajar, go ahead. Uh, I just recently completed my PhD in economics. Uh, my question in line with what Dr. Rahman asked. So you showed that the political regime plays a role in declining inequality. Uh, I would like to know your opinion if political regime uh, plays a role in handling the pandemic and has its impact on, on reducing- It's a lot of background noise, I'm so sorry. I, I cannot hear you very well. There's a lot, lot of, uh, somebody's moving something well. <laughs> so you were so, saying something about the pandemic. Yes, I would like to know your opinion if if, if the political regime uh, uh, if uh, political regime played any role in how they handled the pandemic and hence its uh, potential future impact in reducing inequality in the future. Well, that I I cannot answer with the research, but I can tell you there's some very strange things that happen because the leftist government in Mexico implemented pretty much zero safety nets and did not expand its fiscal deficits, did not implement counter signature policy. And the right-wing government in Brazil expanded uh, safety nets more than probably anybody else in the developing world. Uh, apparently because it was the opposition in the Congress that pushed this, but then the president liked it and continued. So you have very peculiar <laughs> outcomes that somebody will need to study. And I'm not a political scientist, so I will refrain from uh, conjecturing here. But um, by the way, there was a question. So, 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 you know, but it's a fascinating question. I think it, it, there's going to be a lot written about this. Uh, somebody asked me about Costa Rica, if I knew why it was an exception. Um, no, we didn't. I mean, there's no studies for uh, specifically for Costa Rica. Again, Central America tends to be understudied. Uh, and why is it that it didn't experience? Maybe it was already a highly educated country before, so the story through education could not be as prominent uh, because the changes that have to be made are much uh, smaller than in the countries in which you had lots of people with incomplete primary before. So my, that might be one of the reasons, but uh, it, I don't have a specific answer and uh, I wish somebody starts analyzing Central America. And then, the, could, shall I look at the other one on the chat? No, it's uh, Alexis, please ask away. Alexis, are you in Rome? He had to leave, no? No, she, I think she had a question. Sorry. Okay, so Just Alexis had a question. I think she's either muted or she's not here. Uh, the, 
Okay. It's about land inequality, land policy, and agricultural reforms. Um, yes, yes. But she's asked, I can read. We, don't, we didn't analyze what the land uh, policies might have done to, to here, so I, I don't have myself an answer for that. Okay. Uh, but if, I think that in Mexico, for example, you probably would have expected the opposite from happening because with the privatization of the ejidos, I think people started losing access to land at the bottom. Uh, so, but I don't know. I mean, I better not speculate because I don't have a hard date on that. But it, again, it's a fascinating question. So I hope somebody takes it up as a research for You have lots of PhD thesis here that, or master thesis that you can, uh, start uh, directing if the people who are interested in this. So, uh, Dr. Lustig, I have a follow up question. Uh, so, one thing is uh, so, while it is clear that it, before the pandemic, even though now, as you said, that due to pandemic, the, the, the expectation is income inequality might increase, but before that, for that long period, there was significant consistent decline. Was that decline reflected in people's perception that inequality is declining? Because it seems like this is, uh, I'm trying to get at the connection that one is that actual income inequality has declined, but did are there studies that shows that in Latin America, while income inequality was declining, but this was not necessarily people are feeling it, you know, that, that, that perception was not that income inequality is declining. And why I ask this question, just I'm being a speculative, is it seems like while income inequality was declining, there was movement towards people choosing for left-oriented radical governments, right? So, my, so what I'm thinking is that if income inequality is declining, poverty is going down, and as you said, that if it is the case that it is declining across subsectors. It is not just concentrated in urban area or highly educated. It seems like it was across the board. Then did what, what brought this uh, uh, change in these governments? Many, many countries chose the government that were very, very uh, anti-market, you know, and they were more left oriented. Well, for, I mean, I think there several questions here, and some of them are more sort of uh, political scientist questions. So I did look at uh, the relationship, the disconnect between declining inequality and rising protests, because we've experienced that, for example, in Chile, but other countries like Colombia. Um, and I think that um, I, I came up with several uh, conjectures again, uh, one is that even if it's a story of declining relative inequality, absolute inequality continues to increase. So people continue to see that the rich can consume extremely more than what, even, even if you know the genie falls, the differences in income absolute terms are huge. And so that, that could be one force in terms of perceptions, but I don't know if anybody has studied that. The second thing is that uh, we, when we correct the data for what happens at the top, we see that maybe inequality did not fall or did not fall as much or may have even risen in some countries. So even if earnings inequality decline, overall inequality maybe did not. And so that could be another factor, not only the absolute incomes, uh, absolute inequality story. The third one, and this probably uh, may address the question you made earlier, is there other inequities that have caused significant frustration that are not captured by these analysis of just looking at what happens to, to income, even across groups, even rural, urban, uh, et cetera. If you look at Chile, I think that uh, what people have concluded is that it is the system, the, the social welfare system that has shortchanged the population in many different ways that is at the root of the discontent. And let me give you three examples. One is education system. In, in Chile, lot, most education is private, including 
uh, <clears throat> tertiary education is not accessible for free, so people had to borrow in order to go to the uh, university. When they came out, they had large debt. The wages they received were not according to expectations, so there's been a rebellion of the youth against what uh, the educational system is offering to uh, Chile. Chile also has a pension system that when people get to retirement age, they say, this is not enough. No, I mean, and I see that uh, the private uh, pension companies are full of people who are part of the billionaire class, um, the owners <laughs> and uh, in the financial sector. And so why, I mean, <laughs> and I am not able to have a pension that's going to be a lot, allow me to have a decent uh, retirement age. And the third thing is the health system, which uh, in the case of Chile has also resulted in making uh, you know, quality care not affordable. And that has, I think, come to a point in which lots of portion of the population said enough is enough. So that type of inequality, which is inequality of the welfare system through services is not captured by looking at what happens to incomes. And I think that one is the one that has driven a lot of the discontent, particularly in places like, like Chile. No? Well, thank you. Any other question? Huh? So this is, I know, Dr. Lusting, that you, you had to leave early. And, and so this has been really, really interesting. And I, I have a lot of questions more, and but I will uh, ask you more uh, through emails. and. Uh, and so thank you for joining us. Uh, Price, Price has a question, it seems like. I think he was clapping. <laughs> yeah, actually that was just clapping. So, oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> okay. I don't want to get in the way of her if she's got to get, get moving. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, so th thank you for joining. It was wonderful. And and I I, I personally will continue to follow your work. Yes. And, and uh, so thank you for joining. It was wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and the questions were ex extremely interesting. I hope that I'm able to answer some of them with our future, uh, yes, with our yes. future research. <laughs> okay, we will do that. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for doing this, Tahid. This was great. Oh, oh thank you, uh, Price. You know, we have last one for this semi 24th, uh, the workshop okay. on. So that will yeah, be. Yeah, I think I signed up. Yeah. I think okay. I signed up. I missed the last couple because I was teaching. Okay. So, okay. so thanks okay. for coming on Saturday. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Price. Thank you. This was well, very okay. interesting. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Remember that paper I told you about that I was writing about safety nets, history yes, of safety yes. nets and stuff? So I sent you a copy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I will, I will get back to you. If, uh, oh, yeah. Well, just, okay. you know, you, yeah. no, no duties for you. If, unless, okay. unless you have comments, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Okay.